Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Stein with the Department of Aging and Disabilities. In just a moment, you'll hear from Lisa Sorrow, attorney with our contracted legal services provider, Legal Aid Bureau, and she'll be telling you a little bit about the services that Legal Aid Bureau can provide at this time. Um, I hope you're all doing well, but if there's anything we can do, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at 410-222-4257 or 410-222-4464. We miss you all and look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye. Hi everybody, it's Lisa Sorrow with Maryland Legal Aid and the Anne Arundel County Senior Citizens Law Project. I just wanna make sure everyone knows that Legal Aid is still open for business. I'm coming to you right now from my temporary dining room office, uh, but we are working full time all day, every day. If you have any legal questions or issues, feel free to give us a call for intake at 410-972-2700. That's 410-972-2700. Our intake staff will ask you some questions, find out what you have going on, and get your intake to me if they can't answer all your questions for you. Stay safe, everybody. I hope you're all healthy and well, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Hi. This video is about Elizabeth Keckley. The slides included in the production were made by me for a course uh, that I did entitled, What Happened to the Lincoln and Booth Families After the Assassination? Mrs. Keckley, was born a slave in Virginia. But by using her talents and innovative skills, she was able to buy her freedom from slavery. Eventually, she was able to move to Washington, D.C., and she opened up her own dress shop. In 1861, she was hired by Mary Todd Lincoln to be Mrs. Lincoln's personal seamstress. From there, she became a very good friend of Mrs. Lincoln and got to know Abraham Lincoln. I hope you enjoy the show. Elizabeth Keckley and the Lincolns. The picture on the left is Elizabeth Keckley. Uh, she was called Lizzie by Mary Todd Lincoln, and so I'll use the names interchangeably, Elizabeth and Lizzie. Um, what we know about Lizzie is mostly from uh, a book that she wrote later in her life and also <clears throat> from historians who have gathered information about the Lincolns and um, Lizzie was very close to them during the time they were in the White House. So um, that's why I'm going to be mentioning the Lincolns quite a bit. Uh, to, um, uh, to the right of her picture is Abe Lincoln. And below him is his oldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln. Uh, Robert was very proud of his uh, family heritage on his mother's side. Uh, the Todds were very famous in Kentucky. Also, um, during the time the Lincolns were in the White House, Robert spent most of his time at Harvard where he got his degree. And after he graduated, <clears throat> he was given a job in the Army. He had wanted to enter the Army for years, but his mother uh, threw a fit if any time it was mentioned, and she wouldn't give permission, and Abe said no, not to offend his wife. Um, so uh, it wasn't until he graduated, and then Lincoln got him a job on the staff of General Grant, which was a pretty safe uh, position. Uh, to the right of his picture is Mary Todd Lincoln and her two youngest sons. Uh, the taller of the two is Willie, and Willie unfortunately died in the White House a year after Lincoln became president. We'll talk about that later. Uh, to uh, the other side of her is her youngest, and that is Tad. He, his real name was Thomas Lincoln. He was named after uh, Abraham Lincoln's father, Thomas Lincoln. 
Elizabeth Keckley was born in 1818, and so was Mary Todd Lincoln, same year. They started out life together. Not in the same state, though. Uh, Mrs. Mary Todd Lincoln uh, hired her as a dress designer, also as a seamstress, because Mary uh, wanted her to redo some of the other dresses that she may purchase that other people designed. Elizabeth became a confidant to Mrs. Lincoln, sharing in her secrets, and became very close to the president also. Uh, from wh whatever she said, it seemed to be true uh, that Lizzie had a great fondness for uh, Mr. Lincoln and a great respect for him in his office. And she seemed to be able to keep secrets that Mary told her. She became a friend to Mary, in fact, one of the few friends that Mary had even at the end. When Mr. Lincoln died and Mrs. Lincoln had one of her migraine headaches and was in bed, of course, weeping because her husband had been shot right in front of her, uh, the, they called Lizzie to come and sit with her. And Lizzie stayed with her uh, throughout the month that uh, Mrs. Lincoln stayed in the White House after the assassination. Uh, considering there was a new president, he gave her liberal time to stay there. And when she finally moved out and moved to Chicago, uh, Lizzie went with her. At the Lincoln Museum in Springfield, Illinois, you can find many of the dresses, uh, or at least copies of the dresses worn by Mrs. Lincoln. Now they're not quite sure which exact ones uh, were designed by Lizzie. Sometimes Lizzie would design a dress and then take it apart and uh, use the same background and then just change a few things. And also Lizzie took other people's dresses and had to refit them for Mrs. Lincoln. So uh, they're not quite sure all of all the ones done by Lizzie, but I think she had her hand in almost all of them in some way of sewing or mending or fitting. In 1861, Lizzie Keckley had her own dressmaking business in Washington, D.C. And before she got uh, her job working with Mrs. Lincoln, uh, she had many famous clients. Among them was a Mrs. Davis, whose husband was in the U.S. Congress. Mrs. Davis and her family were planning to move south, and she asked Lil uh, Lizzie to make her several dresses. Uh, Mrs. Davis needed them for all the entertaining she would be doing in her husband's new position. Mrs. Davis admired Lizzie's work so much that she even asked Lizzie to come with the family to their no, new home in the South. Verena would need a lot of new dresses. After all, Verena and her husband, Jefferson Davis, would be entertaining many distinguished guests in the new Confederacy capital. Thank goodness Lizzie decided not to go and stayed in Washington. Just by chance, Lizzie saw an article in the local paper advertising that the new U.S. President, Lincoln, his wife was looking for a, a seamstress. All applicants would be interviewed by Mrs. Lincoln. In Gore Vidal's Lincoln, uh, a film made for TV, it starred Mary Tyler Moore as Mrs. Lincoln. She did a remarkable job. And Ruby D starred as Elizabeth Keckley. <clears throat> if you get a chance to see this, uh, series made for TV. Sam Watterson played Lincoln, and uh, as I said, Mary Tyler Moore did a great job, uh, and she was nominated for an Emmy for it for playing Mrs. Lincoln. What did the two women actually have in common? Mary was originally from the South, Kentucky and as a child had been very close to Mammy Sally, a slave who lived in the house. This was especially true after Mary lost her mother and didn't get along with her new stepmother. Lizzie had lived as a slave since birth in Virginia, North Carolina, and Missouri 
Washington, uh, in Washington, Mary felt alone without close friends who would understand her problems. She was criticized by the press and Congress. This went on and on and on, no matter what she did. Lizzie had no family in Washington, D.C., and spent many hours at the White House. Mary felt deep sorrow upon losing her son, Willie, within a year of entering the White House. In fact, she thought she was going to lose her second son, uh, uh, Tad, but uh, she was lucky that didn't happen. Lizzie had lost her only son in the war uh, in the Battle of Lexington in August of 1861. Lizzie helped Mary nurse Tad and Willie through that major illness that took Willie's life and kept nursing with Tad uh, afterwards and was able to save his life. Lizzie was the sounding board for Mrs. Lincoln. She could help her when Mary had her migraine headaches and when Mary needed someone to listen. Since childhood, Mary loved to help design dresses. Lizzie took great pride in her dress designs um, and having Mrs. Lincoln as a client would help her in the future. Let's look at the childhood of Lizzie. Lizzie's mother, Aggie, was a slave living in Dinwiddie, Virginia, on a small farm owned by Armstead Burwell. This master, Mr. Burwell, believed that he could increase his slave holdings by fathering some of the slave children so that Aggie and many of Aggie's sisters uh, became mothers of Burwell's um, children. Although Burwell allowed Maggie to, Aggie to marry a slave from a neighboring farm, his name was George Hobbs, Burwell is recognized by historians as the father of Lizzie. But Lizzie didn't know about this until her mother lay dying and her mother then told her the true story. Mrs. Burwell felt her husband showed favoritism toward Aggie. So she was resentful of Aggie and Lizzie and gave them a hard time. At a young age, Lizzie said a final goodbye to her father uh, who was being sold. And in fact, Aggie had asked Burwell to buy uh, George Hobbs and bring him onto their farm. And he said yes, but then he didn't do it. So at this time, George Hobbs was sold away and Lizzie never saw him again. Lizzie's earliest memory is at the age of four when she started uh, taking care of the master's baby. She didn't realize that this baby was actually a relative of hers also. What happened was she was told that she had to watch the baby who was in a rocking cradle. And as the baby cried, Lizzie just rocked her and rocked her. And at one point the baby fell out of the cradle. And Lizzie didn't know what to do. How do you get her back in? And she's only four years old. So she thought, ah, there's a shovel at the fireplace. So she takes the shovel and tries to pick the baby up with this shovel, which, you know, is impossible. And she got caught doing this and they gave her a whooping. And Lizzie learned her lesson that she had to be very careful uh, what she did. In 1819, when Lizzie was just about a year old, economic conditions in America caused the master to sell his farm and most of his field slaves. He moved everyone else, which included his family and all the household slaves, to another part of Virginia, so that Burwell uh, could be a steward at the Presbyterian College of Hamden, Sydney which was in Southwest uh, Virginia uh, below Richmond. Burwell collected $10 a month from each student at the college and he provided them with three meals a day and firewood. Of course, the household slaves did all the physical work, growing the food, tending the livestock and preparing the meals. When the University of Virginia opened up in 1825, enrollment at Hamden-Sydney dropped. So they had to lower the steward fees 
uh, to attract more students. Burwell cut his expenses by selling off some of his slaves. And he thought, what? The cook has five children. She can spare the little one. So he lied to the girl and told her to get her son dressed up. She sort of knew what was happening and started crying, and he got upset. Anyway, he took the child, went into town, and sold him to a slave trader, and the kid was sold by the pound. When the cook continued to look sad and weepy days later, Burwell got upset and beat her. He insisted she keep a happy and contented face, or he would do it again. Burwell finally gave up the stewardship and moved his family and the remaining slaves to a small farm uh, on a family-owned property uh, elsewhere in Virginia. In 1832, at the age of 14, Lizzie was given as a generous loan to Burwell's newly married son. Robert was, had just been ordained a Presbyterian minister. His parish was small and the couple had very little money so they couldn't afford to buy slaves. Lizzie was the only slave and had to do most of the work. Robert's wife, Anna, had two children very soon and Lizzie then had to take care of them also. Four years later, Robert brought his family to Hillsboro, North Carolina. Lizzie now was too far away to visit her mother and relatives. When Anna Burwell went back to Virginia to see her own parents, she refused to take Lizzie. Thinking her husband was too lenient with Lizzie, Anna had a neighbor, the schoolmaster, Mr. Bingham, whip Lizzie until she was broken of her, quote, stubborn pride. He did this three times over a period of a couple of weeks, but still never broke Lizzie down. Mrs. Burwell eventually opened up a school to earn more money for the family. Lizzie now had more chores to do in the home since Mrs. Burwell would be away at the school. Another of Burwell's neighbors, an Alexander Kirkland, who was the brother-in-law of a state justice, thought Lizzie was very attractive and got her alone one day and raped her. And in 1839, Lizzie gave birth to her one and only child, George. In those days, if a woman, black or white, gave birth out of wedlock, it was uh, considered to be the woman's fault. Now that Lizzie had a child, it was an embarrassment to the Burwell minister and his wife. So it was decided to return her to Virginia to the family. And then she was given to another of the Burwell children. This was Anne Burwell Garland. Armstead Burwell had already died and technically Lizzie was owned by his widow who lived with the Garlands. The Garlands eventually moved to St. Louis, Missouri in 1847, where Lizzie came to know free blacks and began to dream of freedom, since Missouri was a free state. In order to earn money for the Garlands, Lizzie was allowed to sew for others. Lizzie got to keep only a little of the money earned and the rest went to pay for expenses in the home. Now you may wonder why would Lizzie even do that? you know, do a good job doing sewing and being sent out, not keeping her income. Well, for one thing, the Garland said, we need the money. And if you don't do it, Lizzie, we'll have to sell some of the slaves. And that might be your mother. And Lizzie did not want to lose her mother again. So in order to keep the family happy, to pay for expenses, Lizzie would go out of the home to work. And she got to meet some of the very impressive ladies of the city of St. Louis. It was in St. Louis that she again met this man called James Keckley, who told her that he was a free man, but he had lied. He had been a runaway slave. She agreed to marry Keckley if her new master, Hugh Garland, would let her buy her freedom. So a price was set 
at $1,200, which was a lot of money. It would take years for Lizzie to actually earn that. She ended up marrying Keckley in 1852 before she even got her freedom. Mr. Garland had been hired by a Mrs. Emerson to get her slaves back. She had inherited them in her husband's will, and the courts had given them their freedom because they were living in Missouri. The slave family, with the help of abolitionists in the state, had won freedom in an earlier lower court case. Mrs. Emerson now hired Garland and his law partner to appeal that verdict. That slave was Dred Scott. Yes, the Dred Scott. Hugh Garland's brief, filed in March of 1850, had two points. Number one, consent of the master, and number two, military jurisdiction. He claimed that because Dr. Emerson was ordered to the military post, there was no implied consent on his part that he willingly took his slaves into free areas. Therefore, residents in these areas did not work for Dred Scott's freedom. The court had determined in an earlier case that in Ned versus Nate, I'm sorry, versus Ruddle, that freedom existed only if the slave's residence in free areas is with the master's consent. Garland followed um, up uh, his argument with his claim that to a certain extent, military jurisdiction annulled the slavery prohibitions of the Northwest Orient, uh, Ordinance and the Missouri Compromise. He did not deny the constitutionality of these uh, provisions. He simply stated they did not apply in this instance. Garland won that case in the Missouri Supreme Court, but Dred Scott's attorneys wanted to appeal it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Garland died in October of 1854, before that case was heard in 1857. You may actually wonder, how did Lizzie get the money to buy her freedom? She didn't have enough money, but a group of ladies from St. Louis raised some funding for her. They had fundraisers and asked people to contribute on August the 10th, 1855, she, she secured freedom for herself and her son. Lizzie set up a business uh, in Missouri and was able to pay back the loan before she made her move to Washington, D.C. in 1860. Unfortunately, at this time, her marriage fell apart due to her husband's lies and his drinking. Lizzie became the exclusive dressmaker to Mrs. Lincoln. She would come to the White House daily to dress the First Lady. Lizzie's son, George, was a freshman at Wilberforce College at, at this time in Ohio. This was a black college. In April of 1861, he left to join the Union with the First Missouri Volunteers. Blacks were not admitted into the military at that time, but he passed for white. Don't forget, his uh, father was white and his maternal grandfather was white. George was killed on August 10, 1861 at the Battle of Lexington. This drew the two women closer because Mary had lost a young son, Eddie, before going into the White House. Uh, this was years before uh, even Willie and Tad were born. So Mary knew about sorrow, and she comforted Lizzie. According to a White House employee, Rosetta Wells, Mrs. Keckley, quote, was the only person in Washington who could get along with Mrs. Lincoln. And the picture you see there is from the uh, movie uh, by Spielberg called Lincoln and Sally Field, played Mrs. Lincoln and Gloria Rubin uh, sitting there at, uh, at a play, not at the Ford's Theater, um, with Mrs. Lincoln. Um, and you see, she didn't have much of a, um, a speaking role in the movie. You'd see her in there periodically. Um, 
But anyway, that's a great actress, uh, Gloria Rubin. Helping Others. Mrs. Keckley said, quote, if the white people can give festivals to raise funds for the relief of suffering soldiers, why should not the well-to-do colored people go to work to do something for the benefit of the suffering blacks? Quote, I could not rest. The thought was ever present with me. And the next Sunday I made a suggestion in the colored church that a society of colored people be formed to labor for the benefit of the unfortunate freedmen. In 1862, with funds donated by the Lincolns and other patrons in New York City, Boston, and Washington, Mrs. Keckley founded the contraband, which was what they called former slave, slaves, a relief agency, which in 1864 changed its name to the Ladies' Freedom and Soldiers' Relief Association. The group raised money and gathered food and clothing for poor blacks. They sponsored Christmas dinners for the sick and the wounded from the war, and they helped to find teachers for the schools for the newly freed. Lincoln's assassination. Lincoln was shot a week after General Lee surrendered to General Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse. The date was Good Friday, April 15, 1865. Mary and another couple, Major Rathbone and Clara Harris, were in the theater box of Ford's Theater when Booth shot the president. That night, General Grant and his wife were to accompany the president and Mrs. Lincoln to the theater, uh, but the day before they had begged that they had to leave town to visit their son who had come back from the war so they were not there. And so Mrs. Lincoln liked Clara Harris and she thought, well, why not invite her to, to come? They're a nice couple. Uh, and so they did. Unfortunately, as you see, Booth um, shot Lincoln with the Derringer and he had a knife in the other hand and he used that knife uh, on Major Rathbone. After Booth shot Lincoln, he attacked the surprised Major Rathbone by cutting the officer with the dagger before escaping onto the stage, you know, over the balcony. Uh, later, Rathbone escorted Mrs. Lincoln to the Peterson house across the street from Ford's Theater, uh, where Lincoln actually died. Shortly thereafter, um, Major Rathbone passed out due to loss of blood. Rathbone's uh, fiance, Clara Harris, was the daughter of Senator Ira Harris from New York. Uh, the couple were also related because Rathbone's mother had actually married Clara's father in 1848. So they weren't blood relatives. He and Clara uh, were actually stepbrother and sister. The couple uh, actually married three, uh, two years after the assassination in 1867, and they had three children. Rathbone was later made a U.S. consul uh, to Hanover, and the family moved to Germany. Unfortunately, uh, the assassination, and I'm sure people asking him over and over again, why didn't you stop Booth? Why did you let this happen, that happen? And maybe his own internal um, guilt, uh, although he really wasn't responsible for any of this, it, it came as a surprise when Booth uh, snuck in, um, probably unhinged him quite a bit. Anyway, he and his wife had uh, some terrible fights and um, she had to calm him down. At one point, uh, he went in Germany, he wanted to see the children and she was afraid that he would kill them. So she had the children leave and she tried to comfort her husband, but instead he killed her. So he went on trial in Germany and he ended up going to prison in Germany for killing his wife. Uh, their son years later became a U.S. congressman from Illinois from the years uh, 1923 until 1926. Uh, he represented his district, but then he died in office. 
after the Lincoln assassination. Still bleeding from the wound, Rathbone uh, escorted Mrs. Lincoln across the street from Ford's Theater to the Peterson House, where the dying Lincoln was being carried. Shortly after getting there, Rathbone passed out due to loss of his blood. His artery at the elbow had been sliced to the bone by Booth's knife. Mary was crying, of course, and upset while her, uh, she was sitting beside her husband. They took her into another room because of this, and he still remained lying on that bed, actually crosswise, because he was too tall for the mattress. After the uh, nine-hour vigil, she was then taken back to the White House, and Lizzie was called to stay with her and the youngest son, Tad. Afterwards, Lincoln laid in state at the White House. Mrs. Lincoln was so upset, she stayed in her room with migraines and with Lizzie. <clears throat> Lincoln's body was taken by train across the country to be buried in the state of Illinois, uh, where his family home was. Uh, Mary didn't accompany the coffin on the trip and didn't attend the uh, funeral in Springfield. Uh, she sent Robert to accompany the body on the trip, and also on the train uh, was the body of Willie, who was dug up and put with his father. Mary was strong enough to stop his Illinois friends from burying Abe in the middle of town. They told her they wanted to put up a mausoleum and have a Lincoln's body put into that right in a town circle. She said, no, if you do that, I definitely will not send him there. Uh, I want him uh, to be buried with Willie in the same cemetery in which Eddie, the youngest uh, child, uh, had been buried years before. Mrs. Ketley stayed at Mrs. Lincoln's side as they packed the Lincoln's personal belongings and left the White House. They actually didn't leave the White House until May 23rd. This is a long time considering that there was a new president and um, Andrew Johnson had a family, but he allowed uh, Mrs. Lincoln to take as much time as she needed in order to pack up. Uh, Mary did give Lizzie a few personal items that belonged to Lincoln and to herself, but she gave her no salary uh, for Lizzie's time. Widowhood for Mrs. Lincoln. Mrs. Lincoln had private debts to be paid and was afraid to tell her son Robert and the executor of the Lincoln estate, Justice Davis, how much she actually owed. Uh, I can't go into this right now, but uh, you can read about that, how Mrs. Lincoln was spending much more than the allotment given to her by Congress, and so she personally was responsible for it after her husband died. Congress gave her the rest of Lincoln's yearly salary, but continually refused giving her a pension. Uh, she had a lot of enemies in Congress, um, but through her supporters, eventually she got paid $3,000 a year as a pension. That's a lot of money, but that wasn't until years later. So at this time uh, in 1865, she was really worried about how she was going to live. She didn't get that pension until 1870. And later on, it was increased in the year 1881 after President Garfield's widow uh, got a lot more in her pension, people said, hey, it's not fair if you did that to Garfield's widow, why don't you pay Mrs. Lincoln more? But that was only a, just a few years before she eventually died. So uh, it really didn't help her standard of living. Mary and her two sons lived in a series of Illinois hotels or bed and breakfasts instead of moving back to Springfield. Uh, they still owned a home there, but they didn't. she didn't want to go back. Plus the fact her um, son wanted to go to law school and uh, he had to live uh, closer by than in Springfield and she didn't want to be too far away from Robert. Who took care of her during those first few months that she was living in these hotels and bed and breakfasts? Yes, Mrs. Keckley left her own business in Washington, D.C. in order to care for the widow. 
a special federal fund paid for Lizzie's transportation out to Illinois and paid a salary for her out there until mid-June. Now, remember, she only left near the end of May, so it wasn't that many weeks that um, Lizzie actually got paid. But then Lizzie had to finally leave, and she went back to um, her work in Washington, D.C., um, Mary Lincoln was unable to continue paying Lizzie's room and board, and and Lizzie, knowing that she would be financially ruined if she didn't go to D.C., um, she had to leave, but she kept in contact through letters uh, with Mary, and some of these letters later on got her into trouble. Lizzie got back most of her former clients when she went to D.C. and even made dresses for the next president, President Andrew Johnson's daughters. During this time, Lizzie's former owner, Mrs. Garland, uh, got in touch with her. Anne Garland was now a widow, and she was living with her daughter, Nanny, uh, who had been married to Mrs. Uh, married to General Meem, uh, Confederate General, in Virginia. Anne's husband's cousin was also married to a famous general, General Longstreet. Mrs. Keckley corresponded with them and accepted their invitation to visit the family. Lizzie stayed with them for five weeks before returning to Washington, D.C., and some people find this very odd that she would even want to go back to a family that had, quote, owned her, but in Lizzie's case, she felt this was her only family that she had left alive after the war. Mrs. Lincoln had many problems. Besides her headaches and the depression over the deaths of two sons, Willie um, and earlier Eddie, and the death assassination of her husband, she had done things that were not considered appropriate for genteel ladies of the day. Needing money in 1867, Mary attempted to sell her old expensive clothes and jewelry through brokers in New York, but she wanted to do it privately. It would bring too much attention if the president's widow should try to do this herself. Mary was approached by a jewelry company in New York City who told her they could do this for her. Well, eventually they turned out to be crooks. Mary wrote to Lizzie, back in D.C., and asked her to meet with her in New York City in order to help with the dress sales. Without any money, Lizzie was asked to get two hotel rooms for Mary and for Lizzie. But due to her race, the hotel that Mary had wanted would not accommodate both of them if Lizzie was with Mary. When Mary showed up late that day in New York City, they had no hotel room. They had to find another hotel, but still, even when a hotel let them come in together in two separate rooms, they couldn't eat together in the dining room. No money for Mary Lincoln. Mary could not remain in New York City for very long. Her sons expected her back home in Illinois, and they were not to know anything about this sale or the fact that Mary still need to pay off, needed to pay off debts. Again, given no money for expenses, Lizzie had to stay in New York City with friends of friends while doing this job for Mrs. Lincoln, who went back to Illinois and Lizzie was left to supervise. Unfortunately, the brokers, who, I, as I said, were crooks, they had advertised and displayed the beautiful dresses in their store, but nobody was buying anything. People came to view and to touch the fine materials, and nothing was sold. The brokers then proposed to take the exhibit on the road and charge admission so more people could see it. And of course, they were going to get a good percentage of that money. 
trouble again. The press found out about the exhibit and the dress sale. The incident was a major embarrassment and humiliation for Robert Todd Lincoln, who was clerking to be a lawyer back in Illinois. Many of Lincoln's friends had political aspirations for him. To some in the press and in Congress, Mary's actions bordered on lunacy. It brought back the old stories about Mary, which were negative. But being a black woman, Lizzie certainly couldn't do anything to clear up all the malicious gossip about Mrs. Lincoln. Or could she? Hmm. the book which caused the end of the friendship. James Redpath, a Scottish American who had been a friend of Frederick Douglass, helped Lizzie edit her book, but only her name appeared as the author. Without her knowing it, Redpath had given um, the publisher of the book 24 personal letters written by Mrs. Lincoln to Lizzie. And originally, he had been told, don't give this to anyone, don't put it in the book. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. When the book was published, these letters were in the appendix. Robert Todd Lincoln was furious that an employee would divulge private stories about the Lincolns, even though they weren't even mean-spirited. Robert pushed for a campaign that the book was not true. And Keckley didn't sell many copies while she was still alive. Good thing is that book is still in print today, over a hundred some years, and it still brings in a lot of money, but unfortunately only to the publisher uh, because Mrs. Keckley and her heirs are long gone. Were any secrets revealed in Lizzie's book? Not really. Other people were writing books about Abe Lincoln and his presidency, and there were a lot on the market right after the Civil War. Abe's law partner, James Herndon, had interviewed hundreds of the Lincoln friends and relatives for his own book, which was filled with personal stories. Also, it contained many negative comments about Mary. Um, Herndon really never liked Mary, and in his uh, biography of Lincoln and uh, Lincoln's relatives, he uh, wanted to get back at Mary and included a lot of stories that maybe weren't quite true. In comparison, Keckley's book was very tame, but Lizzie had exposed comments that were considered private, and that was the difference. Newspapers that had condemned Mary over selling her dresses now defended her because she had a disloyal black servant who had published her employer's private letters. In the spring of 1868, the pre-publicity for the book caused the biggest uproar. By that summer, it had died down, but so did the meager sales, meaning Lizzie didn't make money off the book. By October of 1868, 
Robert Todd Lincoln had married Mary Harlan, a U.S. Senator's daughter, and they eventually had three children. Robert started his legal career, which led him into politics. In order to escape the public pressures as a presidential widow, Mary, along with her young son, Tad, took a ship to Europe, where they stayed for two and a half years, while Tad uh, went to a speech therapist and also took classes at local colleges. Lizzie had returned to Washington in order to start up her former business, but she never heard again from Mrs. Lincoln. But Lizzie did make another mark on history. She continued as a seamstress to the elite in Washington, D.C. for several more years, and she hired additional sewers and took in apprentices, and even though she did lose some of her elite clients due to the publicity from her book, she still was able to have good business. But in 1890, needing money, she finally had to sell her personal Lincoln mementos, including the cloak that Mrs. Lincoln wore on the evening of the assassination, probably with her husband's blood on it. Charles Gunther, a Chicago candy manufacturer, bought the whole lot from a broker at the price of $250. It is not written how much Lizzie actually got paid out of that. In 1892, she accepted a position to teach at Wilberforce University, and she was made head of the Department of Sewing and Domestic Science Arts. In 1893, she organized the Wilberforce Dress Exhibit at the Chicago World's Fair. In the late 90s, Lizzie returned to Washington, D.C., because of her bad health. Lizzie spent her final years at the National Home for Destitute Colored Women and Children. It's ironic because the home was started by the organization that she had founded during the Civil War. Lizzie had made a quilt from old pieces of Mary Lincoln's dresses, and she tried to give it to Mary, but couldn't give it, get it to her. Uh, there was no one that would give it to Mary from her. Lizzie finally sent it to Robert, who never opened it, and he never gave it to his mother. Years later, it was found in Robert's house, and that's how it became noted uh, that Lizzie had made this because of the um, information with it. Today, that quilt is at Kent State University in Ohio. Mrs. Keckley is lost. Elizabeth Keckley actually died in 1907, and she outlived Mary Lincoln by 25 years. Never heard from her in all those years after uh, the incident of the uh, selling of the clothes happened. Elizabeth was buried near her relatives in Harmony Cemetery in Washington, D.C., in 1959, a developer paved over the cemetery, and all the graves uh, that were there were reburied in unmarked graves. In the late 1950s, National Harmony Memorial Park was uh, contracted by the D.C. government to move the historically black Columbian Harmony Cemetery, which had fallen into disrepair. In 
Original location of the cemetery was Rhode Island Avenue, Washington, D.C., also known as Harmonia Burial Grounds, located two miles from Washington, D.C. on Brentwood Road and the Columbian Harmony Cemetery. The cemetery was moved to Landover, Maryland in 1959. Now it's known as the National Harmony Memorial Park Cemetery of Landover, Maryland. According to a 2000 uh, Washington Post article, 37,000 remains were disinterred and moved to what the Bells named the National Harmony Memorial Park. It took two years to locate Lizzie's grave, but in 2010, a marker was placed at her grave site in the National Harmony Memorial Park, where you can visit her today. The end. I hope you enjoyed the show.